Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to uh, talk to you today. I think that uh, the Lord Mayor's challenge to us is very appropriate for the subject that I've been asked to talk about, the question of <coughs> OI in adults. The main problem, as I see it, is that if you are an adult with OI, no one thinks about you. And that's really picking up from exactly what the Lord Mayor has challenged us about. We tend to think of OI as a problem that affects children. But of course, most, and with the improvement of medical care, increasing numbers of children with OI are now surviving into adult life. And the question of how we manage people with OI who grow up and become adults is more and more of a, a, a problem for those of us who are working in bone disease in adults. And one of the problems is that a lot of people do not have experience of people with uh, OI and they don't really know what to do. There are several areas of medical problems that you need to think about in people with OI as they get older. There's the bones themselves, but other areas of the body are affected. Many of you only too well know the problems with joints, with lax ligaments, the problems with hearing, and perhaps some of you know the problems associated with the heart in people with OI. If we look at our clinic, I've got about 100 or so people uh, attending the MRI bone clinic with uh, OI. And about three years ago, one of my uh, registrars had a look at our clinic population. There's data on about 75 or 80 patients there. And you can see that we've got people from teenage years right up to quite elderly uh, uh, adults. So it affects the whole age spectrum. It's unlike osteoporosis as uh, we tend to see it in the adult population. It's no great respecter uh, of uh, sex. And so the problems as people get older are not just the problems of their OI, but how the problems of OI interact with the problems we all suffer as we get older. So if we look at each of those areas that I look, defined a moment or two ago, heart disease sounds dramatic. Studies have shown that there's some evidence of uh, heart disease in uh, a lot of people with uh, OI, but for the vast majority of people, it's of no consequence. When they come to clinic, I might listen to their chest, I might hear a heart murmur, but it doesn't affect your life. And certainly in my clinic, I've got no one who's got major heart problems as a result of their OI. Some of those older people we saw in the clinic there have got heart disease because they're old, they smoke, they eat the wrong things, and perhaps because of their bone disease they don't exercise uh, as easily as some other people. But for <coughs> most adults with OI, heart disease is no different from the community outside. Hearing is something that's more specific uh, to people with OI and tends to be more of a problem in the adult community than uh, in the uh, uh, than in uh, childhood OI. And paradoxically it happens 
because the bones in the middle ear and the inner ear actually get hardened. So a disease that uh, is primarily a disease of brittle bone, there is a condition known as otosclerosis, where the bones that transmit the sound from the outside to the hearing organs in the inner ear get hard, they get stiff, and they don't work. And sometimes that's mean by surgery, but uh, it uh, is uh, often best dealt with uh, with uh, hearing aids. Some of the literature says it happens in about 50% of people. It's in my clinic nearer 20%, but actually it's something we can do something about. So it's something we need to be on the lookout for. So I'm always asking uh, patients uh, uh, about uh, their hearing and I tend to get the response uh, that it's the uh, partner, the husband or the wife who says, oh no, the hearing's awful. You send them to ENT and they give them a clean bill of health. So I think that's what they call selective deafness. <laughs> um, uh, of course, one of the major problems in children with OI is the loose ligaments, the loose joints, the dislocations, the, the problems that go with that. As you get older, the ligaments do stiffen up, same way as everyone else does. I'm not as stiff and as supple as I was uh, 30 or 40 years ago, and I wasn't particularly uh, supple in those days. So. Uh, uh, I'm uh, now stiffening up uh, and uh, it happens whether the ligaments are normal or whether they've got the abnormal collagen that occurs in OI. And the same thing happens to joints because joints have a capsule of collagen around them that is made of exactly the same stuff as the ligaments. So as you get older, your joints uh, will stiffen and we do get uh, some of those older people in my clinic have problems with their uh, with their joints that uh, need uh, uh, attention but the interesting area of course are the bones and this is the data drawn from my clinic when we reviewed it three years ago and what i've shown there is the t-score which is a measure you get from a bone density scan that shows how much an individual's bone differs from young normal bone values. And so if you are a normal young person, you would expect your T-score to be between minus two and plus two. And the first thing you do if you look at that graph, you see the top dotted line is zero. That's average for a young, normal person. You can see that a few of patients in my clinic have bone that's definitely normal. And actually, over half of them are certainly within the young, normal range. And that probably to some extent reflects the population that we, we see. So the vast bulk of my patients have mild OI, type 1, some type 4. We have a few patients uh, with type, uh, type 3 and the two very low bone densities were two men with uh, type uh, 3. So you've uh, got uh, a, a group of people whose bones, in terms of numbers, don't look too bad. And in fact, the lower dotted line, at minus 2.5, is the threshold we normally use to define whether someone's osteoporotic or not. So you can actually see, in my clinic population, it looks as though the majority of people with OI are not even osteoporotic. So that's great. Some of that, of course, reflects treatment that they've been given 
before they came to me. And one of the things that we have noticed is that the younger people coming through to the clinic who've had aggressive bisphosphonate treatment uh, as uh, children are tending to be taller, they have better bone density, and so we're reaping the benefit of the treatments that have been given in childhood. But in this population, only about 40% had uh, previously been treated with bisphosphonates, and what uh, we uh, actually see uh, is that you can't work out which of those were previously treated or not from the numbers there. The final thing you can take from this slide is if you concentrate on the red dots, the women, there was some concern that even people with mild OI who had not done badly in young adult life, and remember the clinical picture with mild OI tends to be that your fracture rate declines as you go through puberty and enter adulthood, there was a concern that as you went past the menopause and ran into the risk of osteoporosis, things might get worse again. Well, you don't actually see a fall off in bone density there. So news might not be as bad as you fear, which is always a nice point to, to go on. In my clinic, reflecting this, although we certainly do see more fractures uh, than in the general population, we don't see vast numbers of fractures. People will break vertebrae, they'll crack ribs, but tend not to have major limb fractures. See it occasionally, but not very often. So, what do we do about treatment? Well, the mainstay of treatment in adults with OI is the same as with children with OI. So, uh, we tend to use bisphosphonates. In adults, we'll tend to use allandronic acid by mouth or zoledronic acid uh, by injection, largely because allandronic acid was the first really effective oral bisphosphonate we have, and it's the one we have the experience with. Uh, and zoledronic acid, rather than formidronate or APD, because we have a lot more evidence about the use of that in adults with uh, osteoporosis, so we've tended to carry it through into uh, OI. Whichever one you give, the way it works, it blocks the body breaking down bone. As a result of that, bone density increases. In a normal osteoporotic population, we're very clear that if you block bone breakdown, you reduce the risk of fracture. It's not so clear in patients with OI. Uh, the studies show that bone density increases in patients with OI that we give bisphosphonates to, but there's not a huge suggestion that it reduces fractures. Now that might be, just might be, because fractures are not that common in adults with OI, as I've already said, and therefore we just haven't looked at enough people. Or it may be because we know that when we look at these adults with OI, they're not breaking down bone very fast to start with, and therefore we're not making a huge, huge impact on their bones with these treatments. And one of the things that we've learned about with using bisphosphonates in people with other conditions is that it is possible to have too much of a good thing. It is possible to damp down the bones too far. The bones need to have old bone taken away, new bone put back in its place, and if you do 
that too much. Uh, if you damp down the bone too much, you don't let that happen, and the bones can actually become fragile as a result of that. It's a bit like, I suppose, at the airport, metal fatigue on an aeroplane or something. If you don't change the components in a plane, they get brittle and break. If you don't take away old bone and replace it, the bones get brittle, brittle and break. And this is a, uh, a lady with uh, osteogenesis imperfecta uh, seen in uh, my clinic and she was one of the uh, first uh, OI people I treated with uh, bisphosphonates probably uh, 20 years ago now and she had an awful lot of bisphosphonate and she was uh, out jogging and uh, noticed a pain in her side and if you look you'll see there's a crack in the pelvis there compare it with the normal side there and what had happened was the muscles had just pulled off a piece of bone and we wonder if that's not just because we had treated her so aggressively because we thought a little bit so at that stage we thought a little bit's good a lot must be even better mm -hmm. uh, we might have over treated her and caused her bones to be brittle so I'm not saying don't use bisphosphonates because they are very useful if you target them correctly what I am saying is use them with caution. When you give them to children with OI, they have dramatic effects and I think it'd be very hard to over-treat a child. The effects in adults, because the bone biology in adults is different, the effects are less marked and you've got to be careful not to over-treat them. So if we can't use bisphosphonates, what can we do? Well, we've only got one treatment at the moment that uh, stimulates new bone formation, and that's a drug called teriparatide. The disadvantage with it is that you have to inject it. Inject it daily, like a diabetic might inject insulin. It is a highly effective drug, it increases bone density and certainly in people with uh, osteoporosis is the best treatment we have for reducing fracture risk and there's strong suggestion that in adults with OI it will do that. Studies are underway in OI. The big problem with it is, is Ten times as expensive as bisphosphonate. Well, probably now, actually, now the bisphosphonates are cheaper, a hundred times more expensive than uh, bisphosphonates. <coughs> and therefore, it is difficult to get access to. I've recently sent a business case to NHS England to uh, have it included as a treatment for uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. It'll be at least the middle of next year before I here whether that's been successful or not but uh, it is certainly a way forward but what we need for people like yourselves whether you've got OI uh, or looking after and caring for someone with OI is people to be looking at the new treatments that are coming forward for other bone conditions, particularly osteoporosis, in people with OI. To make sure that the benefits that we see in people with osteoporosis do indeed translate, and to try and work out what's best for you. So it's an area where we still need more information. So really, to wind things up, I thought it was reasonable to say, having started with the ignorance of the medical profession as a whole about adults with OI, saying, well, what can you reasonably expect from a doctor who's treating you? With regard to your bones, I think you can reasonably expect someone to keep an eye on your bones, 
to follow up your bones, to do bone density scans. You don't need to be that regularly. Perhaps if you're stable, no more than once every five years, though more frequently if there's any concern. They need to check the biochemistry associated with bone. Not just, and some people would argue not even bone turnover markers, but things like vitamin D status, which is important for general bone health. And if you've already got an underlying bone condition, uh, then it is even more important you look to things like that. And your doctor must be prepared to offer you treatment where it's indicated. With regard to the other areas, your heart probably isn't going to be a problem, but the doctor who's treating you must be aware that there are potential heart issues and be prepared to refer you on, and in particular, arrange for an ultrasound scan, an echocardiogram, if there's any suggestion that one of the heart valves might be leaking. And finally, they must be aware of the hearing issues. Keep an eye out for it and be prepared to refer on for additional treatment if necessary. Thank you.